Hi, and welcome to In Focus. This is Jabbar Al Obaidi. In this episode, we'll take you to Jordan as our guest is Dr. Jawad Al Anani, uh, former uh, Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister in Jordan. He is now the President of the Jordan Economic and Social Council. In fact, he is well known in, in, the, in, in MENA in the Middle East and in North Africa uh, as a, one of the experts in, in the economy, as his economist. But at the same time, he uh, landed on so many important positions in, in Jordan. Dr. Uh, Al Anani, uh, it's an honor to have you in, in this in focus, and I think our audience will uh, enjoy uh, what they're going to uh, really listen to what you have in terms of the three, three aspects. One of them is uh, I know uh, we, we had you uh, as you know, a, a key participant in the panel discussion regarding the withdrawal of the United States from Afghanistan uh, this past August and how the things really went and pleasantly to different directions. And of course, uh, a lot of questions uh, were raised. One of them, how and why and what are you know the impacts of such uh, kind of really unorganized withdrawal from uh, from Afghanistan? But that's so that's one one aspect because uh, that's really important. The second thing uh, I think we would like to see uh, if we can discuss some of the uh, foreign uh, aspect of the United States uh, foreign policies uh, toward the Middle East and and the world. And third, where is you know, as as a major player, uh, United States, uh, in comparison to to China, and of course uh, also with Russia. So you have you have the the, the third aspect of it. You have Russia, you have China, and you have the European Union and European countries. And uh, of course, uh, you know the current uh, administration, uh, Joe Biden administration, that I kind of strike a balance between these uh, three. Uh, three aspects. So let's just start with, uh, with, with Afghanistan. Uh, with Afghanistan, you came up with this uh, concept, uh, which is there are some losers and, and, and there are some, some winners. Can you address this in, 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 in a way that uh, our audience will, will understand what you mean by that? Thank you. Well, there was a, a big debate whether the United States uh, was leading the Middle East, uh, especially after now what we heard yesterday about we finally withdrawing all US troops from Iraq with the exception of uh, certain consultants who remained behind. Also, we, we uh, heard the news uh, that the Americans have left, uh, had already left uh, Afghanistan. And uh, it was like you said, uh, uh, described by many as unorganized withdrawal, uh, which uh, left so many uh, humanitarian related questions unanswered. And uh, the way it, uh, it was reminiscent of what happened in Saigon uh, in the mid seventies. So in a way, uh, you know, everybody was uh, viewing this and uh, those who had the memory to witness what experiences gave themselves the opportunity to compare and ask many questions. Yet, of course, the interaction of such a huge and immense event meant that the United States, the question that came after that uh, was whether the United States was actually abandoning the Middle East because it is now going to focus on China and then probably Russia. But then the question that I always raised with myself, it is because of the challenges that the United States is facing vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Russia and vis-a-vis -vis China that they should not leave the Middle East. So we have to distinguish between two things. One thing is withdrawal and leaving and not leaving and, 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 and taking and uh, this, uh, uh, the, uh, the, what were they called, the, the, the sizing or undersizing, they're downsizing their own presence with boots on the ground. This is one thing, but 
what is was actually happening is that they were repositioning themselves in different places where it would make more strategic sense uh, to address such challenges in the future. So as a result, you know, Jordan had now, has now the 10th largest embassy the United States has anywhere. And the staff there has increased tremendously. The second one is that we have now bases in Jordan, military bases for the United States that are being built. And uh, thirdly, the relations between Jordan and the United States are continuously you know, in their eyes. And right now they, and they are debating what would be the next uh, you know, financial package that would be given to Jordan. So in a way, Jordan ended up being a ben beneficiary of that. So uh, why, why is Jordan important? Because if you are in Jordan, you don't have to be so much in Iraq. You don't have to be so much <laughs> you know, in other Gulf states because Jordan is very close to Iraq, very close to Syria, very close to Israel, very close to Palestine. And also it's on the borders of the Gulf states, including Saudi Arabia. So in a way that gives the United States a very good opportunity to stay in a very stable country uh, and make sure that it can together with its naval power in the, in the overseas, on the seas, to really manage that. So Jordan ended up winning as far as UN relations are concerned. But at the same time, you look at countries like, for instance, uh, uh, Gulf states, some Gulf states, where the United States downsized their, their presence there uh, uh, to, in a, to a big way. And therefore, Jordan ended up having much stronger relations with the United States at this particular juncture in time, which really gives Jordan further security <laughs> feeling that they are secure, they are in the protection under the protection of a, a large country like the US. So in a way, Jordan ended up being a winner from the repositioning of troops in the United States, of the United States in the region. And I think that right now with the flaring problems with both uh, Russia over Ukraine, Ukraine, and also with China who sent 13, today they sent 13 uh, jet planes, you know, fighter planes over Taiwan. So in a way, you know, we see that there is uh, the ex-communist world in a way you might say, uh, is really ganging together and trying to neutralize the US influence and threats to both Russia and China at the same time, as if they were saying, we are one country. So in a way, Jordan is now in a much better position to as an ally of the United States than before. And that was the point I was making. However, we need to revisit every country and see what will happen. Now with Iraq, of course, what happens to Iraq if the nuclear negotiations do not materialize with Iran? What will happen? Will Iraq be safer or less safe than before? That is a question that we have to, to raise. The second question, what will happen to countries like the Gulf states, whether the United States is willing to you know, go to war with, the, with Iran over if, if the nuclear deal is not there. And that scenario is not completely off the table because every US, the minister, the secretary of defense, uh, the secretary of uh, uh, even the president, President Biden himself, you know, have already been voicing such a thing, not with a very strong open language, but at least they remind everyone that it is still on the table. Uh, and so we are living now through a very critical period, but the United States is repositioning itself in order to be most effective in deterrence, and if there is any, any military action, they will be there for it. So, so how about uh, you know the Afghanistan itself as a country, as a, as people after twenty years of so-called uh, national building and state building, state and nation building, and now you know the argument is just uh, well, this is uh, now is up to them because we we have done what we have done. Uh, what, what do you think? I mean, is it that they are on the losing side? Well, Afghanistan, in the, you know, the many of the Afghanistani opposition and liberals who are not Taliban, 
Yes. You know, we're hoping that the U.S. presence or the United States will stay in Afghanistan until such a time that they reached a full-fledged agreement with the Taliban, allowing them to have a diversified government, a government that is representative of all the different components of the Afghanistan society. Uh, but we ended up with a government that's basically Bashtun, a Sunni, <laughs> and uh, with oblivious with an oblivious eye to the rest of the population uh, women in particular feel that they could have been more empowered to exercise their own rights basic rights they feel now that they have been somehow let down uh, but anyway i think that there was no way for the united states a, a, a continued presence to affect that change the way the people, the proponents of change were hoping for. Because the war, you know, was almost futile. Uh, staying there for two, three, four years is not going to change the outcome. The United States had to leave eventually the country. And it was for sure obvious that the sooner they left, the better. So uh, uh, that ended up with, now can, will the United States then again go back to the Vietnam? issue. Will the United States go back as an investor, as an influencer, without having military presence in Afghanistan? Will Afghanistan be open for U.S. investments, for U.S. economic help, for U.S. educational system to, to come in the, into the picture? I think we have to, uh, to bargain for that because the Afghanistan still are euphoric. You know, they are still happy with the victory they achieved. So, but very soon they will be much more in touch with the reality. Being mm -hmm. on the opposition is something and being responsible for feeding the people, making sure they live uh, nice is a completely different task. And when they are in touch with reality, I think they will begin to open up, uh, will be more open for dialogue and more constructive dialogue. So it is a question of time. Uh, a question of time indeed, but uh, you know, doctor, uh, the the public opinion in the United States now is, as you know, is is deeply divided, and one of the really divisive uh, issue is uh, over uh, Afghanistan and the withdrawal from Afghanistan. I mean, as as an observer, uh, do you think? A, a delay, and I know you mentioned that just earlier, um, probably two months, three months, a year. Would that have made any difference? Well, let's let's look back, uh, uh, Dr. Jabbar, and see what happened in the during all these negotiations that were taking place, uh, directly or indirectly, between the United States and Taliban, uh, focusing on the Doha uh, negotiations in particular. You know, there was no way, to be honest with you, I mean, let's be realistic. There was no way for Taliban who had won the, the war to surrender all their doctrinarian positions overnight. You know? I mean, and change them. How would they face their own supporters? You know, the people who supported them, supported the Taliban would not allow them to, uh, to effect a Saudi type change as uh, Mohammed bin Salman had done in Saudi Arabia. I mean, this was not thinkable. Uh, it, it will take some time, like I said. And I think, of course, there are losers in the, in, the, in the meanwhile. There are people who are going to be victimized, women probably who will be mistreated, uh, uh, probably abused and bullied and denied uh, the right to go to schools. But I don't know if that outcome was completely unavoidable. I mean, I have deep feelings for those ladies and for the women and for the children. But at the same time, the Taliban could not have obliged such requests with an open arms because their constituency or the people who supported them are still, you know, believers in the paradigm which really made them win the war, according to them, of course, quote unquote. So in a way, we should be more realistic about what to expect and, and when to expect that. So, okay, so a realistic approach and a realistic analysis. Uh, so there is a, a, an a argument uh, and really uh, opinions uh, in the United States. They said, well, 
what happened in, in, in Afghanistan now, uh, that actually contributed to the mistrust uh, uh, equation when it comes to the relation between the United States and uh, the rest of the world, and especially uh, their friends in the in the Middle East, in the Middle East and North Africa. What what, what do you say uh, to the those who are coming with this argument? Well, it, it it makes sense, of course, but then let's say if the United States had such a leverage, you know, uh, throughout the region and throughout the world, uh, people would complain about the fact that sometimes the United States does not behave in exactly the same way they had expected. So what do you do? You say, okay, I'm cross with the United States. I'm not happy with their policies. They are flip-flopping on me. You know, you can't use all these words, but at the end of the day, when it comes to reality, you know, you have to deal with the United States. You just cannot bypass the leverage and the importance and the influence of the United States in something else. So uh, of course, over a long series of events, you know, that would impact the United States uh, a reputation and standing. But in the short run or the medium run, I think that people will always remember that many issues could not be solved without the United States being there. Because if it does not lend its support, at least it will not lend its opposition to that thing. And if it opposes something, then practically that thing may not be tenable. Uh, I, I look at the Palestinian, Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. Okay, everybody I mean, is not happy with the, the Arab world, is not happy with the United States position. But who would say that the United States role in arriving at peace eventually is not important? You still say, okay, we don't like the US position. It is biased. It is very much pro-Israel, for instance. But at the same time, everybody is saying, I cannot do it relying on Europe. I cannot do it relying on Russia or China, you know? So if there is an, a superpower that has to come, it is the United States, which will still hold the ace count in the whole equation. So would, would you say uh, that, you know, new government that would be formed in, in Iraq after the election, uh, now they, they saying, okay, United States is out and we, we don't need any uh, help, military speaking. Uh, would you say uh, this argument will kind of subside a little bit and say, yes, uh, I think United States will come. It's it, it just like uh, the analogy, uh, they left the country from the front door, but they will come back to the country from the back door. Yeah, I, I don't think that they have left uh, that uh, far because they are not that far away, you know? I mean, if they need, or emergency requires that they should come back, well, they will find, uh, you know, find a way to, I mean, they have troops around, they have military power, they have also what I would call aerial power, you know, yeah. which is uh, in terms of rockets or airplanes, you know, so they, they are there. I mean, okay. the question right now for the United States is not Iraq. The question on the challenge right now, in order for you to resolve issues, like Iraq and uh, Yemen, Syria, and probably, I don't know where, but let's focus on these three countries, is how to deal with Iran. Mm -hmm. If you, you know, so far the Iranians have been uh, resisting any addition to the agenda, and they want to limit that only to the nuclear, uh, nuclear, nuclear capability negotiations. But uh, the others are saying, okay, but also <laughs> that nuclear capability enabled, you know, Iran to have a leverage to help and create a wedge into these uh, three different countries. So the question is, will you accept a final deal, peace deal with Iran without resolving the other issues or without limiting the influence of Iran in those regions? Now, what, what kind of a deal will that be? Will there be power sharing? Will there be, for instance, uh, ad adding a new competitors to Iran in the region like Turkey, for instance, uh, or Egypt in the future, we don't know. But that is 
we have to wait for that to, and see. In the immediate, right now, I think the United States focus for internal, for the both domestic and external policies is uh, putting uh, relations with Iran back in order as the United States envisage, envisages that. Do you do you think, uh, Doctor, the the need for such uh, either to resurrect the 2015 um, um, nuclear um, agreement or come up with something new? Do you think uh, uh, the need for that is more critical for uh, Biden's administration and United States in general, or is also that the same thing being shared by the European? Uh, mm. uh, countries and and those who are attending these meetings. Yeah, well, if you read uh, Thomas Friedman's, I think he wrote Thomas Friedman. The New York Times wrote an yeah. article about this particular issue, in which he said that uh, Joe Biden made a terrible mistake as a president of the United States by not joining back the nuclear negotiations in the first week of his administration, by allowing time to pass. You know, now he cannot do that without actually dealing with the other issues uh, which the Israelis are raising and they are pressing him. And do we saw that the Minister of Foreign Affairs, you know, traveling to the States and the uh, uh, I mean, Minister of Defense traveling to the United States and to hammer in this point in particular. Uh, so when it comes to Israeli security, when it comes to uh, uh, this is not Netanyahu speaking or, you know, flashing those maps that he usually does, you know, but this is a new government that everybody wants to stay or wants to see stay because they don't want to see Netanyahu come back to the scene and, uh, and disrupt everything. So what I would say is that it is more complex now and uh, the time when uh, the administration could have done what the Europeans have been calling for, I think is a little bit late for them now. That's why the United States is negotiating, negotiating indirectly. They are watching that, hoping that the Europeans would succeed at least in scoring the points they want to score by limiting the capability of Iran to produce an atomic bomb. But at the same time, they hope when they step in, step in they will lose their, use their leverage to convince the Iranians to renegotiate their uh, role in the region. Now, um, you know, the Iranians, of course, they, they understand that. I mean, they are savvy in, in terms of, of their, uh, their negotiations. And uh, so would that probably delay uh, actually reaching an, an agreement? Well, it depends on how far things could go. You know, the Iranians are very savvy and I think they take collective collective decisions, you know, they are, there is a group of elders in Iran who really discuss things, they put their scheme, they put uh, intelligent plans, to be honest with you, and they use what I would call, or what is commonly called, carpet weaving approach. You know, let's do it stitch by stitch. They can do that, it's in their, in their, in their psyche, it's in their culture, you know, why, why, why are you in a hurry? Okay, mm -hmm. let's do it fine. Now, it is the United States which probably may feel the sense of urgency, especially coming midterm elections. And so they don't want President uh, uh, Trump to go back and say, so I told you, you know, they, I mean, there is no use negotiating with Iran. And mm -hmm. if they choose to go to war, that is also a very difficult option. So, this is a, a mousetrap, to be honest with you. And mm -hmm. I don't know how to maneuver your tactic to convince the Iranians that the threat of war is very serious and without going actually, without actually going to war, getting the goodies without putting the uh, war tax on the table, you know, as a price. No, very, very interesting. So. So you have uh, on, on one, one issue is uh, Afghanistan and still, of course, uh, is really, uh, you know, bowling there and lingering, you know, I mean, the media yeah. uh, and the public opinion, they always talk about these things. Then, yeah. then you have the negotiation 
uh, about Iran, and you just put it in a very, I think, uh, really important perspective. And and then uh, you have uh, the and probably you you could call it in a new wave of uh, in a Cold War with, with China. Uh, yeah. what, what what's your perspective on that? I mean, China, China, yeah. that you know, a few weeks ago, and actually last week, they said, well, we are not losing money because the United States money actually in China. Mm. So well, I mean, you know, they made it very clear. Yeah, yeah, of course. But, 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 but the Americans, you know, American administration has already uh, is thinking of putting tax of taxing American companies that stay in China. So in a way, you know, why would the American, what, what is the benefit of American business staying in China and exporting from China to the United States if they lose their tax haven in China? You know, so this is a, a tit, tit, tit for tat. You know, this is a tit for tat, economically speaking. Uh, so the, the Chinese are responding to the United States in that case. But then the United States has so many Chinese donors. <laughs> It's not, I mean, there are many lots of, of, of American investments in China, but in return, there are in the, in, the, in the US banks and so on, there is so much Chinese money, probably over excess of 1.3, 1.4 trillion dollars worth. So we're talking about a huge amounts of money. And that could be very disruptive to the world economy at large. If the two countries decide to go for an out open uh, economic war, then the whole world would lose, not only the two countries. The, the second point that I would like to make in this regard is that the United States should be very much concerned about creating unholy ally, you know, at least from the US perspective, between Russia, China, and adding Iran. So that makes it very tough. You know, while uh, uh, the soft points of, the, uh, of, of, uh, of China is Taiwan, and probably of Ukraine, but in return, you know, the soft points, uh, the United States could face such a, 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 tri a, tri a trilateral arrangement between those countries. And that will bring the world closer to the, I mean, we are seeing a brinkmanship uh, a diplomacy being exercised here. So we have to see who says ouch first, you know, who blinks first. <laughs> I mean, do you think in, in this case, uh, the United States has been actually reactive rather than proactive? Well, in the dynamics of things, in the long run, it does make a difference. You know, everything is both uh, uh, um, direct and indirect <laughs> result, both uh, uh, active agent and inactive agent. So in a way, you know, in, in the long run, it does make difference. In the short run, yes, sometimes they are reactive, sometimes they are active. So what, what happens is that, you know, you hit me there, I take an active, so I react to that action of yours by taking an active action somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So to create some sort of a balance between the two. So it is a tug of war. It is a tug of war. Uh, and uh, things, things are not easy, you know, Armageddon <laughs> scenario is there and some people are getting scared, but I, but then we always say what uh, Sir James Jeans, you know, British philosopher one time said, the first world war we used airplanes, second world war we used atomic bombs, third world will use space. <laughs> the fourth world war would use axes and souls. <laughs> it, it is devastating. We cannot really uh, afford, we cannot afford uh, another third world war. Uh, it's just uh, Armageddon scenario. Dr. Jawad Lanani, thank you so much uh, for this very uh, powerful conversation. We appreciate your time and hopefully to, to see you uh, sometime in the near future. And thank you for watching In Focus.